Hello and welcome to this special edition of Talk Time. My guest today is top Supreme Court lawyer Indira Jaising, who is also a very well-known human rights activist. She appeared at the high-profile Sanawallah detention case at the Guwahati High Court yesterday. Ms. Indira Jaising, welcome to my show. Thank you. You appeared at the, in the high-profile Sanawullah detention case at the Guwahati High Court yesterday. The High Court, in the very first hearing, granted uh, Sanawullah interim bail. That has come as a huge relief for the army veteran who was declared a foreigner by a tribunal sent to a detention camp. So what does this case and the High Court's quick grant of interim bail reflect? Well, first I'd like to say what it means for me. Uh, it releases an emotional dam. And I think as a lawyer, you know, we wait for moments like this when we become the medium to get justice for people who have been unjustly detained. The right to life and liberty is the most precious life, right, in the Constitution of India. And to answer your question, the signal given by the High Court is that they care about the right to life and liberty of every single person in this country. Uh, you call it a high profile case, but I say he's just another ordinary citizen of India. It's true that he has served the nation, but uh, when he comes before a court of law, he is a person seeking justice. Yeah. Whether he's an army man, whether it's a VIP, VVIP, that's a material. A citizen cannot be declared a foreigner and sent to jail. Uh, so that is the basic problem. Yes. So whereas I am thrilled uh, with the message which the High Court gives by being swift, by being prompt, by respecting the right to liberty, I am equally pained by the way in which the foreigners' tribunals are uh, deciding cases of this kind. The basic issue is we are a country which we, we have never lived by documentation. We are not a country which has a strong database. For example, a birth certificate, a death certificate. And this gentleman uh, was uh, born at a time when it was not mandatory to have a birth certificate. Now you tell that person, prove that you were born in the country. What can he do apart from producing a secondary school leaving certificate which gives his right. date of birth, mm -hmm. his passport which gives his date of birth, his discharge certificate which Yet you have a tribunal which says you are not an Indian citizen. He's clearly covered by Section 31A of the Citizenship Act. He's a citizen by birth. Right. Now, when you say, when you say that, you know, when you question rather the tribunals, uh, you know, the way they handle the case, but the tribunals, the particular judge or the particular staff in that particular concerned tribunal might now argue, okay, fine, we based our judgment on the basis of the investigation report provided by whichever agency in the Assam government. In this case, it is the border police of the Assam police, border, border wing. Uh, now, how do you counter this? Because is it not the responsibility of the tribunal and the judge concerned uh, to actually go into the veracity of these documents and at least cross-check. Yes, it is the law declared by the Supreme Court of India that, uh, you know, think of the word investigation. Right. Investigation means you proactively try to find out the truth. Yeah. You're not sitting there to just like a recording machine, like an auto, I can just take my phone and start recording A, B, C, D, E, but that, then I'm not an investigator, right? An investigator means a person who goes out of the way to ascertain the truth. The biggest uh, thing I think which impressed the High Court is the fact that the investigation report says that he was a laborer on the very day that he was in in public service, on the very day that he was a government servant, on the very right. day that he was serving in Manipur. So should the tribunal not have seen through the bogus nature of that report? That is the question. No. Now, as a lawyer and as a human rights activist, Ms. Indira Jai Singh, uh, question is, what does it reflect on the investigations? Don't you think this case, after this case, the people's fate in the entire machinery investigating the nationality issue uh, in Assam and perhaps uh, similar exercises are going to be, uh, start elsewhere in the country? So I think that will begin or I mean already started a question mark in this whole exercise. 
a sense of doubt in the mind of the ordinary citizens. See, let me tell you, it has come to my knowledge that even indigenous inhabitants of Assam have been declared foreigners. I'm sure you're aware of this. Two cases have now come to light. This has been highlighted in the media. One, a notice had gone to a woman by the name of Madhubala Das. Madhubala Das had passed away 13 years ago. Now the police came and picked up Madhubala Mandal just because the first name matched. That person is in detention center for three years. I'm quoting media reports. This is not my own information. Now, second person is another indigenous person by the name of Naveen Barman. Now, these are cases which has come to light. It's up, at the end of the day, it's up to the court to give a final verdict. But based on prima facie media reports, this is what is the case. That's what you are saying. Well, yes. You know, but I think the responsibility, as you yourself point out, is not just of the court. Every single person involved with the administration of fact-finding, with the police function, with law and order, I would say, right, political responsibility has to be taken for these issues as well. Because it's the top persons who set the tone of justice. This is why the High Court order is so important. It mm -hmm. is also about messaging to the community <coughs> that, look, we are here. We are here to supervise what is going on in our tribunals. But it's tragic. It's tragic because I feel that even one day of deprivation of liberty is something this country should not tolerate. Now, now you know, this, this case, particular case, uh, you know, the person concerned, Sanola, happened to be a serviceman, ex-serviceman. Uh, he was an honorary captain who, who retired from the Indian Army, having served uh, the nation for 30 years. And then a set of lawyers led by a very senior lawyer, Hafiz Rasid Ahmed Choudhury, he picked up the case and his juniors had picked up the case. Now, issue and it, it has got the media limelight. Now, what about cases, for example, Madhubala Mandal, uh, that case, she has been, this lady, poor lady, has been in the detention center for three years. The case has come to light triggered by the focus on the Sanaullah case. Uh, now, do you think the high court or any competent court needs to provide a set of guidelines to these tribunals? Begin at the beginning. First and foremost, how are we appointing people to these tribunals? Are we doing any screening? Are we looking at their sensitivity? Are we looking at their knowledge of law? At the end of the day, citizenship is the most precious right that you and I can have. The entire edifice of the Constitution is built around a citizen and the rights of a citizen. And these, I would say, they're the most important tribunals um, in the country because what are you doing? You know, the label of foreigner, it's like a curse word for someone who has been living in this country, born in this country, laboring in this country, contributing to this country. You call that person yeah. a foreigner. It's like a curse, right? So these foundational tribunals have to be strong. Now, now the government, now the government of India is saying that they're going to set up 1,000 more foreigners tribunals in the state. That's because the entire mega exercise of coming up with the at a, with an updated national register of citizens uh, that is going that exercise is going to be over in a couple of months, and after which a certain number of people will be uh, considered to be foreign nationals at the end of the day because if their names not find appear in the final list of the NRC. Now these people are going to move the tribunals. The courts, of course, are there for them to approach, but first their cases are supposed to be handled by these tribunals and therefore the government is planning to set up 1,000 more tribunals. Now in this country you know better where you know thousands of lakhs of cases are pending in various courts across the country because there are not enough judges. Now where are you going to find 1,000 tribunals? Uh, so this is also a key question, it's a big challenge before the authorities. Yes, where are you going to find these 1,000 people from who are trained, who are sensitized to the ethos of the Indian constitution, to the law, to the law of citizenship, 
to the law relating to foreigners. Where will you find these people? What are you going to do? You're going to pick up retired individuals from here and there, uh, you know, people who are looking for jobs. Not necessarily judicial officers. Not necessarily judicial officers and not necessarily even trained, you know, to, to yeah. deliver. Look, we are talking about justice. And as I told you, not just justice, we are talking about the right to citizenship. Yeah. So uh, unless we just want to round up people uh, like you do in a riot or whatever and say this is an unlawful assembly and you want to just push them out. What is the point of all this? But, you know, I want to raise another issue which, you know, recently the Supreme Court passed an order saying if you've been in a detention camp yeah. for three years, you're entitled to release on certain conditions. But my question is, even if you're declared a foreigner, have you entered into bilateral agreements with the governments of the countries to which you say they belong so that they can be properly rehabilitated in the country of their so-called origin? No. So what are you going to do with these hundreds and thousands of people who you call illegal immigrants? Right. You see, Where are they going? Where absolutely. are they going, these people? Absolutely. On that note, we go for a short break, but don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. I am in conversation with top Supreme Court lawyer and human rights activist Indira Jaising. Ms. Indira Jaising, you see, the issue of illegal migration is an extremely sensitive issue in Assam. For the last 40 years, we have been grappling with this issue. Yes. Uh, everybody wants, including me, that every single illegal migrant who had entered the state of Assam or anywhere else in the country after 1971, which is the date set stipulated in the Assam Accord, uh, after 25th March 1971 should be detected and thrown out. So there is no doubt, there is no problem with that. Uh, I mean, I fully support the Assam Accord. Now, it has said 25th March 1971, that is the day when Bangladesh was born. Uh, okay, if you have migrated to India illegally after that date, you must be detected and thrown out. But in the name of detecting a foreign nationals, putting one single Indian national uh, tarnishing that person's image, uh, putting him, him or her in a lot of mental stress uh, just because you have goofed up an investigation, that is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and, and, and that I don't think anybody, including the government, doesn't want. So what is the road ahead? How do you go with this kind of investigation? Yeah. Because you cannot be dictated by emotions when investigating cases. Yes. Uh, well, I agree with you. I also think, yes, it's important to identify foreigners. And as you say, this is something that concerns, concerns the state of Assam and the country as a whole. Yeah. Where I have a slight disagreement with you, uh, when you use the word thrown out. Okay? I mean, deported. Yes, yes. Uh, Do, I, I, I take back that word, deported. Yes, yes yeah. deport. You're right, deport. But there is a due process of law for deportation. Yeah the country to which you're deporting them, you have a perfectly fine diplomatic relationship with your neighbors. You have to work it out, okay? Fine, so far so good. Now to answer your question on the way forward. Yes, I think the High Court and the Supreme Court both should lay down guidelines. That is important. Yes, it's very, very important on how tribunals are supposed to function. The very first thing, let's begin with this case, the kind of inquiry that was done, was it not the duty of the tribunal to look at that document and say? No, absolutely. No, no sorry to intervene. Uh, you know, th that is what Sanaullah uh, had said, that I never got a notice. That's what he said. That's what he claimed, I would say, that we, I never got a notice. I was not given an opportunity to present the documents in front of you, the, I mean, meaning the tribunals. He, he, had a, uh, he had a passport issued in 1994. He had 30 years of service in the Indian Army. <coughs> I mean, he had president certificates and so on and so forth. Question is, uh, the tribunals could have just held up, hold, hold on, uh, delayed their judgment. They could have asked a, a certificate from the Army uh, whether this guy uh, actually really served or not. Yes. Or for that matter, uh, give uh, due credence to his passport. Yes. That's why I told you there are judgments of the Supreme Court which oblige the head of a tribunal to be proactive in finding out the truth. In Sanaullah, we were dealing with a person who I would describe as a truth 
teller. Here was a person who every single document was obtained from his village. He was not running away from here to there to there to there and getting false documents. Now that was obvious to a blind person and those documents were all presented to the foreigners tribunal. Question is how and why did the foreigners tribunal go wrong? Why did he have to run to the Supreme now, Court? The big question is Sanaullah had spent 10 days in a detention camp. Uh, you can imagine a man's mental stress and agony when you are declared a foreign national. You know, when you are a citizen of this country, you are dubbed a foreign national, you are sent to a detention camp. One can imagine the level of agony of that man had gone through. Now the question is, is it enough? Okay, fine, he has got an interim bail, he has restrictions, he cannot move out from a certain district. He had to pay 20,000 uh, bail bond and securities by two people, so on and so forth. And then the case lingers on. He he has to it is, it is the, he has to push his case so that he get a final relief from the court. Now, who compensates for all these things? You know, and what happens to the tribunal people? Uh, I'll not use the word judge. To tribunal authorities who had given that verdict based on. What happens to the police? Who, where does the buck stop? Is it that that SI sub-inspector who uh, has fudged that document? That is what uh, the popular belief is. Uh, is it that, or the buck has to stop at the higher authorities? Who is responsible? Does do you think the state government now has a role to play? Yes, the tone of delivery of justice is set by people at the top. The state government your Minister for Home Affairs, the Minister for Home Affairs at the centre, the Chief Justice of India, the Chief Justice of the High Court and every judge sitting in the High Court is a person whose role and job it is to deliver justice. Let's not forget this case is a case about justice for you and me. Think about it. If this can happen to Sanaullah, can it not happen to you? Can it not happen to me? It can happen to anyone. To anybody. So this case is a serious challenge to the justice delivery system in this country. It's an eye opener. And that is why I started by telling you, for me, yeah. it releases an emotional dam. We were suffocating, you know, with the oppression that we see in the justice delivery system. But this releases a dam. So therefore, the very first question you asked, what is the symbolic value of this judgment of the High Court? I'm indeed very grateful to these judges for giving the bail, although it is subject to conditions. That is, that is the best part in this country. We still have full faith in the judicial system, yes. in the judiciary, that at the end of the day, you are going to get relief from one institution, yes. that is the judiciary. And in this case, the judiciary did not let us down yesterday. So that is the symbolic value of this case. It's the judiciary telling the country, we are there for you. If you face oppression at the hands of the police, if you face oppression at the hands of the executive, we are there for you. And this is what I think is the most precious. All right, we'll go for another short break. Stay on, we'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back. I'm still in conversation with Supreme Court lawyer and rights activist Indira Jaising. Now, now uh, suppose there is a case, suppose somebody is to file a case against the very judgment, uh, if I may use the word, very decision of that particular tribunal and the particular people manning the tribunal, uh, bring that particular, make a party. Now you have made various people party, not the tribunal people. Suppose somebody were to make the tribunal people a party to this case as to why did you give this verdict? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that tribunal can pass off the responsibility to the police? Okay, I based my judgment on the basis of these papers which were given to me by the Assam police. No. Do you think that will hold? No, I'll tell you the reason. As a lawyer? As, not at all. The reason why is that the Supreme Court has already delivered a judgment in which they have referred, if you'd like to know the precise provision of law, I can tell you, please, please. section 30 of the Civil Procedure Code, which makes it very clear that a judge is there to find out the truth. A judge is not there to 
I said, you know, a judge is not a postman who's making a delivery, accepting a document from you and passing it on to someone else. No, they are there, especially tribunals. They, and remember, the record of the tribunal goes to the High Court, right? Uh, so the Civil Procedure Code Section 30, as pointed out by the Supreme Court of India, is very clear that you sitting in a tribunal are not a postman or a postwoman. You are supposed to find out the truth. You, he, they could have summoned the army officers and asked them, did you issue this discharge certificate? They could have found out whether the let, uh, passport office had really issued the passport. They could have summoned the state secondary school leaving board certificate and said, did you really issue this certificate? Sana, uh, Sanaullah would not have been in detention for one single day if they had done that. So I would like to tell you. Now, uh, what about the police authorities? At the end of the day, the question arises whether the tribunals have the power to direct the police to also take the person and send him in jail. Uh, there is an opinion during, during the rounds that the tribunals, we, uh, we, I'm not clear on this, subject to correction. There is, a, there is an opinion during the rounds in the legal circles itself that the tribunals can only give an opinion that X is a foreigner or X is an illegal migrant and so on. And it is then up to the state government to act on that. Now, that apparently, superficially looking at it, uh, that did not happen. Uh, and the man, in this case, Sanaullah, was taken uh, to the detention center in a very, very hasty manner. Don't you think it is also the responsibility of the civil administration uh, to also check? Because by that time, by that time, by that time, the case was already in the media. Yes. Was it not necessary for the district administration to also check with the army authorities? Uh, you know, okay, a ordinary person, villager, you go, they, they don't know whom to ask, that's okay. But here, you can ask the army authorities, you can ask the external affairs ministry who issues the passports and so on. So there are a lot of uh, people you could have gone to. Yes. Uh, I would go to the extent of saying that if, as you suggest, the law and order machinery, the state government, had done its due diligence. Maybe they should have filed an appeal in the High Court and said, Listen, look, this is our man, and he's not a foreigner, and we have come before you challenging the order of the tribunal because we believe that he is an Indian citizen. Nothing to stop them from doing that. Okay? So to make this an excuse that once an opinion is given, uh, it's it's automatic execution. It's like saying you will be given the death penalty automatically. No. Every civilized system of justice must also give a person an opportunity to appeal against an unfair and unjust order. So I, this is just an excuse. It, it goes back to what we were discussing earlier that the tone of justice, the tone of law and order, yeah. the tone of administration is set by people at, from the lowest level to the topmost level, we all have to do our, I would call it a professional duty. After all, as a lawyer, what did I do? I did my professional duty, right, representing him. Similarly, a police officer has to do his professional duty, his or her professional duty. The media has done its duty of bringing, the, bringing this particular case to the public domain. I can't help but agree with you there. And I have to say that if it wasn't for the fact that the media highlighted the injustice, I want you to focus on the word justice, justice, justice. If the media had not highlighted the injustice done to one Sanaullah, we would not be sitting here today. I wouldn't so, be here so talking finally, to you. So finally, 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 uh, Mr. Raj Jai Singh, uh, before I ask you the question, so, so you agree that the media is not to be blamed for all the ills in this country? So uh, that, that, uh, that you agree? Uh, that, there is media and media, and there are judges and judges. Judges and judges, media and media, very and diplomatic. And lawyers and lawyers. Very diplomatic, very <laughs> legal is there. Uh, you know, my final question is, do you think that this particular Sanawalla case is going to impact on so many unknown cases, uh, such there may be two people have, two cases have already come to uh, light, come to the public domain, there could be a few more. Uh, do you think uh, this case will now, uh, you know, bring in some kind of a direction from the, either the courts or the state government themselves or the tribunals themselves will be a little more careful? Are you optimistic about this? About, about this? 
Indeed, yes, because the very judge who gave this order will now have to go through introspection and, you know, think, where did I go wrong? And that, you know, I was yesterday, and normally I don't even watch televisions, pardon okay. me, but that's the way it is. Uh, I don't actually own one. Uh, but yesterday, because of this case, I was watching, and I was so impressed by an interview given by Salahullah's daughter. And, and she said, I'm amazed, she said, my father is only one Salahullah. There are so many others sitting in detention centers. What about them? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. You know, we have a very, very popularly elected government in Assam, led by a very dynamic chief minister, Abul Sarbananda Sonwal. Uh, you know, and I'm sure uh, after this case, he, and he had personally said that he's going to intervene uh, personally in this case. Uh, he might have done his bit as well. Uh, but we hope in the days ahead, the Assam government will pass clear-cut guidelines to these tribunals and the police set up to come up with better investigation procedures and pull up those people who have perhaps faulted in many, many cases uh, yes. as far when investigating the nationality. Administrative action should be taken Ab against action. them. They could be suspended, Absolutely. they could Absolutely. be dismissed from service. Absolutely. We hope, we hope better days ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Indra Jai Singh.